Yeah, I will record it on this end and then give you a link to the video and the audio. This time, uh, I have us on split screen, so both of us can be seen. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, did you ever uh, make that other recording public or decide not to? Not yet. I, I, I definitely want to do it. Uh, that will probably happen this week. I was waiting for the right timing for it. Ah, uh -huh. all right. Yeah, timing is everything. Indeed. Indeed it is, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, anyway, I mean, uh, you know, the number of things that would interest me to talk about, and I'm, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm open to your suggestions. But one of the things that, that <clears throat> I've had my attention on lately um, is just these, um, I guess, sub-personalities or voices, mm -hmm. uh, as I call them sometimes. And uh, as I, for, as, as I sort of try to map them out, or at least some of the areas, I mean, there's a whole cacophony of them, you know, but, uh, uh, and there seems to be pattern to them. In other words, uh, yeah. there, there's oppositions and they're, they're, roughly they seem to be voices that are reaching out and then voices which are withdrawing, you know, and then of course there's, the awareness of both of those, which is probably your your uh, whatever what you call your third force there, you know. Your, uh, yeah. But I guess I'm kind of looking at what what's the best way, or what's a good way, at least, to work with these uh, personalities, these voices. You know, I mean, I, I suppose well, the simple answer or the obvious answer is to well, you you, you, know, you sit back in this third force awareness and then you can take on any or all and any particular one of these voices any one time and play with it and as long as you don't get stuck into any one of them you know um, they're just tools available to use and yet it seems to me that there's probably more that can be done with them you know more that the I mean they, they all represent sort of partial intentions almost partial uh, motivations towards certain directions yeah. and I, I find at least in my own experience that they sometimes well not more than sometimes they often uh, conflict and almost um, uh, sap each other's energy you know there's there's this uh, they're kind of an energy drain as well as a way of being in the world you know? so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of curious what, what your take on those is well, um, my thoughts are that uh, there are basically two ways to work with them. Uh, there is what I would think of as the psychological way, the way that alters behavior. And then there is the way that reintegrates them. So it, the first one is the most common. And there are several different ways to do that. Uh, Milton Erickson was famous for being able to do this. Uh, so it starts with the presumption that each voice, each part of you has an intention, as, as right. you noticed. Right. And that those intentions will always be positive uh, in their uh, formation, even if they're negative in their consequence. Exactly. So uh, mm -hmm. what I've done occasionally is put somebody in a trance and turn off their conscious mind and then just talk directly with the voice, mm -hmm. find out what its intention is, mm -hmm. find out if it can fulfill its intention with a less destructive behavior exactly. uh, and then teach it how to do that behavior. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty common. Uh, another way can, to do it can, is, go yeah. Ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I can find I can do that without putting somebody in trance. You could actually just ask to speak to that voice. Or and yeah, if you do that, you've put them in trance. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the definition of a trance. Okay. All right. Uh, sometimes it's it's nice to put them in a deep enough trance that their conscious mind doesn't try and muck about with things, mm -hmm. because the the conscious mind is very good at editing. Yeah. Um. Another way to deal with them 
is uh, what uh, the NLPers call a parts party, which is you get the voice that uh, is doing the behavior that you don't like, and then you bring in a couple of other voices, maybe a, 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 the part of you that is really good at reconciling problems, mm -hmm. uh, the part of you that is creative for solutions. Right. right. Um, and I, I have back in my old days of, of having a practice, I would, again, put somebody in a trance, make their conscious mind go to sleep for a while so that it wouldn't muck about and then uh, get a parts party going and then tell each part, look, here's the problem. You guys find a solution. And when you found it, let me know that you found it and that you're all willing to do it. And then I just wait, wait. Yeah. maybe read a book while uh, the unconscious mind is churning through it. And they would come up with solutions that by and large worked wonderfully. Um, you have to be careful with your, your ecology on this to make sure that the solution doesn't violate some other part of the person. Right. Because uh, right. that creates problems. But right. uh, that's relatively easy to do as well. So off the top of my head, that's two ways of working with the voices to uh, get them to create more functional behavior. The latter that's, one... Like I said, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. The latter one sounds a little bit like what I most often do but which is basically as i as i talk to this voice i find i i invite the voice which is in opposition to it because typically if it's hanging around there's an opposing set of voices right and well, as very, i get both well. as i get both sides to articulate how they're serving the person or how they're serving me there's usually then an it seems to be able to call on a voice that sort of includes and transcends both of those opposing ones into kind of a, you know, that picks up the good parts, so to speak, and, and integrates them, at least partially integrates them for the occasion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's similar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. so th there's lots of variations on these. Right. And it, it, it you know, it, it works for changing behavior. It's a, a very useful tool. Um, and for most people, that's all that's needed is, uh, you know, you have a negative behavior, it's having a, a, an unfortunate impact on you, you change it, life gets better. Um, then there is the other side of it. The other side of it is to reintegrate those voices, to create not a thousand different little mini eyes that right. are each vying for uh, attention in the world, but to uh, um, basically reabsorb each of them into one single permanent eye. Right. And that's certainly the most interesting. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hard bit. Right. So speak yeah, to that. That's one. what I'm more interested in. So. Right. Uh, this, this goes back to uh, um, Gurdjieff's model of this, which is that man is not one eye, right. woman is not one eye. Right. Uh, and that our little sub-personality routines, the only reason that we don't notice it is because they all have a, a few things in common that make it whatever eye is in front. You know, right now, there, there is an eye listening to me, and its name is Ilmar. Right. And it's using that body right. and it's using the set of default habits that come with that body. So the next eye that pops up will also have the same name and the same body and the same set of default habits. So it's very hard to tell one from the other, right. at least right. according to Gurdjieff's theory. And that's, that's close to the, the idea of the commanding self. The commanding self is not one. It is the I am legion thing. You remember the I am legion thing from the Bible? Yeah. Yes, yes. I yeah, it's, well, it's at least a phrase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was uh, when Jesus cast the demons out of the out of the uh, the the crazy man and cast them into a uh, herd of swine. He asked the the name of the demon, and the demon said, "My name is Legion." Ah, that's right. <clears throat> I remember that one now. Yeah. Yeah, and I take that as a metaphor for exactly this. That Good the, uh, yeah, that, you know, the, the, the person, uh, the, uh, 
the unreconstructed person is is not a unity it's a, a multiplicity and that multiplicity tends to fight among itself uh, okay so that's part of the work yeah, is to create the single eye okay so let's push on that a bit you know i mean okay what is that i mean one way of looking at it is that the only single eye is the awareness that is aware of all of these subpersonalities, and but are you suggesting that there's actually like a personality which you, you which is created, which is kind of this a synthesis of all these different persona personas? Um, to a certain extent, we need a personality to exist right. in the world. Right. Without it, we don't know how to tie our shoes. Right. We don't know how to drive a car. We don't know how to eat or digest our food. Right. You know, uh, what one of my Sufi teachers said to me years and years ago, he said, Mushtaq, God will annihilate your ego. And then in that very same moment, he will give you a new ego that is perfect because you can't live in this world without the ego. That, so far, my experience bears this out. Uh, I have seen a few people who are, are without ego, and the only reason they're still alive is because people tend them. Yeah. You know, some master sitting in a cave, he hasn't moved, he hasn't spoken, he hasn't eaten, he hasn't defecated in 20 years. The only reason they know he's still alive is because his hair and his fingernails are still growing, and once a week he takes a breath. There's, okay, so... There's two models here that, that, that would make sense. I mean, on one model, it's creating an ego, which is now basically your only ego and your unified ego and the one you use to play in the world. The other model is your, this awareness, which has essentially this, this uh, selection of sub egos to play to pick and choose and you pick one appropriate one for each occasion so to speak and there's no particular yeah. need to unify them into a single ego and i wonder what the advantages of one or the other of those approaches would be uh for being in the world the second probably has more advantage the, the be, being able to slip from persona to persona right you know what persona actually means in the Greek, right? The mask, right? I mean, that, is that mask? Right? Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So personality, persona, it comes from the Greek word for mask. Right. Right. And uh, so we need to be able to to do that. The unified eye can do that just as well, because the thing is, whether you have a unified eye or a bunch of little eyes running around uh, getting into trouble, you are still you. The essence still remains the essence. The, the I uh, that we see, the persona, the mask, is, is just an object that we identify ourselves with. Exactly. So exactly. In, in one sense, it is, uh, if you are going for um, you know, abiding non-dual awareness, for lack of a better term, then unifying the I is the way to go. Uh, because it, you take back all of that excess energy that is there to maintain all of these other eyes. And you could still <coughs> put on whatever mask you need. It's just that you're doing it from uh, a place where you are not identified with the mask. You go, okay, so we need to be the teacher at this moment. Let us be the teacher. Okay, so we need to be person who plays with the dog let's play with the dog and so a, a, a unified eye can actually probably more efficiently take create each of these personas than a bunch of fragmented eyes okay but now l l let me let me stop you a bit on that so okay uh, there's at least what's coming across to me is a certain ambiguity there i mean is this unified One eye that you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one well, might, but uh, but let's try to cut a few of those ambiguities through, slash them with a sword of whatever the hell it is. But uh, 
one one view one way of looking at that is that that unified eye that you're talking about is me grounded in in this clear dual non-dual awareness okay the other sense of this unified eye is that it's a persona which has been built as an integration maybe and a clarification of a bunch of these pre-existing uh, sub personalities and those two seem to be different don't they or are uh, but they are not okay that's they are what totally i want to say. not because okay. you're, the, the mistake that you're making there is you're thinking that that which abides within uh non-dual awareness has anything to do with the persona other than owning it like a pocket watch the persona <laughs> is the persona it is an artificial construct it is right. made from your nervous system. It is in the body. It is mechanical. So are you saying, are you saying that the only way I can operate, well, the only way I can operate in the world is through a particular persona and that your advice is essentially to have a unified persona rather than a collection of splintered personas is that well, that's not even my advice i am saying that but it's not my advice um i am saying uh if you want to to play the game of being in the world which is what we're playing right now right you need the proper tools right one of the tools that is essential for being in the world is the persona it is the right. ego. It is the machine. If you think that this is not the case, try to drive your car consciously. Do it someplace where there is no cliffs to drive off. Right. right. So there are, there are necessities for a personality in this reality game. We're living in Maya. We are living in the, the world of the... Uh, well, we say illusion, but if you walk into a wall, the illusion hurts. Exactly. Uh, but we, we have to play that game if we want to be here. It's right. the difference between being the Buddha and being the Bodhisattva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The Bodhisattva keeps their ego. Right. They keep their connection to the world, and the ego is the connection to the world and the connection to the body. Now, uh, one other way that I talk about it is I say, uh, your ego, your machine, is asleep, and it's having nightmares. When the machine is asleep, it is very active, and it's running around all over the place. When the machine wakes up, it's quiet. It's attentive. It does its work. So another way to think of this is the difference between the sleeping machine running without a governor and the awake machine that is there to serve that which perceives. Okay, okay. There's still something and All here. of these are metaphors. The parts, I, the parts thing is a metaphor. It's not I, real. I understand. I you know, understand. It's, it's yeah. a way of talking about this. The machine is a way of talking about of this. Of course. It's because we don't have any words to talk about it in reality. Right. But those words are pointing at something which is really there, you know, or at least yep. there in the, in the world, and something that, that we deal with either consciously or unconsciously or that essentially deals with us maybe sometimes but you know so it's you know it's it's i find it a, very useful to actually try to get some clarity on this you know um i mean i'm yeah i mean that's, that's there's there's another issue as to what the function of words is and to what extent we get caught up in them but but uh, but I, I actually value the ability of words to point to things you know um, and I am aware of the danger of words to suck one into an illusion, basically. You know. um, yeah. Well, words are the map. They're not the territory. Exactly. That's exactly. the difference. Exactly. As long as we remember that, we're cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know. So, okay. Uh, so the growing up process is that the process 
of unifying the personality, the persona, or is it a process of becoming aware of that which you already are, which is this consciousness or whatever you want to call it, this this non-dual awareness, this clear deep heart mind, whatever, you know. I mean, there seems to be two different things going on here, both of there which are. seem to be in important, you know. Yes. Becoming an adult is different than becoming enlightened. Right. Whatever the fuck enlightenment is. Right. Uh, well, it's, in your place, it's waking up, right? Yeah, in, in, my, in, in my model, waking up is what it is. And, okay. and that model I take straight from uh, the sources. You know, when you look at uh, the Sanskrit writings of the old masters like Patanjali, they, they don't use any term that is anything like enlightenment. There is no light coming in. Right. They also don't use the word meditation, which is interesting. Yeah, meditation comes from the Latin, and it's, it's the same root as medicine. Mm -hmm. Meditation means to heal. Mm -hmm. What uh, the Indian sages talked about was not meditation. They talked about um, the last three of the eight spokes of yoga are... Um, concentration, uh, profound, deep focus, and flow. That's how I would translate them. Mm -hmm. And Tihyana, Tihyana is this, is, became Chan in Chinese and Zen in Japanese, is the word that we translate as meditation. But it doesn't mean to heal anything, per se. It means to have a profound, uh, focus and engagement with the object and then letting the object disappear. Uh, oh God, a, a great book from uh, Roger Zelazny had this line in it. Imagine a leaf drifting down the well, then let the leaf disappear, then let the well disappear, then contemplate the drifting. Um, kind of like that. Was like, who was that? Roger Zelazny, one of the world's great science fiction writers. Right. I believe that came from uh, a book called The Lord of Light. Yeah. Which is a book that everybody should read just because it's brilliant science fiction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't, it's not one that I have read, so I might have to look into that. I'm surprised, yeah. actually. It's, it's about a, uh, a planet far, far away where the Buddha comes. Yeah, I've read quite a bit of science fiction when I was a kid, but uh, haven't been not yeah. that one. Yeah, this one I read when I was probably 15 or 16, yeah. and it, it had an effect on me. I, I read it every four or five years still just to go back and go, ah, that was great writing. Resavor your... <laughs> yes. Re yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, there are some books that are worth doing that. Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so, back to this, though. Yeah. Uh, actually, before we get back to that, uh, I don't know if you get a, had a chance to look at that uh, poem that Ajashanti wrote when he woke. Yes. Well, it's, a, it's a beautiful description yeah. of that waking yep. process. Yeah, I, I, I have seen that poem once or twice. As, as you may, may or may not know, Ajya is one of the people who I really suspect in the Enlightenment biz. In what way? Uh, in that he's the real deal. He oh, I see. And that's from, I said, you said respect or sexual awake. No, respect. Oh, re I thought you said suspect, and that's why I was curious. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. No, no, no. I suspect everybody, but I, I, I respect him. He's, uh, I've watched him over the years. He is consistent in the truth that he speaks, and he walks his talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't do much better than that. That's so, true. Yeah, it's, he's one of the people, if, if somebody is looking for uh, a teacher along those lines, he's the guy who I recommend. Yeah. Yeah, I've never met the guy. I mean, uh, well, I've, I've seen, I've heard him, I've, I've uh, presented stuff yeah. like that. I never, I never had any personal interaction with him, you know. But, but that poem. I believe that he's, cool. yeah, yeah. I believe he's still around here. He's, he's worth, he's worth paying attention to. Uh, yeah. 
No, he definitely is still around. I mean, he's. Uh, I see. Yeah. You know, announcements of him doing. Oh yeah, he, I I think uh, he used to live in Los Gatos, which is just right. you know, hop, skip, and a jump from here. Uh, right. So I I I believe that he's still there. I've never been to one of his satsangs. Never had uh, felt the urge to, but uh, I do every now and again check in on on the stuff that he publishes publicly just to see what he has to say. And on top of all of that other stuff, he is one of the kindest teachers I have ever seen working with people. Hmm. He is so gentle with people's egos. It just it's it's mind boggling that he has been gifted with that much patience. Which I take it you have not, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, your uh, method seems more, a, you know, a black and white type method. <laughs> uh, not necessarily black and white, but my method is definitely one that, uh, you know, if people bring their wounded egos to me, I tend to send them somewhere else. Uh-huh. Right, right. Mostly to Aja. He may not forgive me for that. <laughs> Let me close the door. I'll be right there. All right. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, um, so the, the growing up process, or at least the process that we're engaged in, whether it's growing up or not, seems to then have really two different asks in a sense. One is the creation of this unified ego the other is the recognition of something which has always been there but is but has been yeah. hidden. i think of the growing up process as this a human adult uh one who has moved actually through the uh, chrysalis of puberty rather than being stuck there uh, is like a lucid dreamer they become awake within the dream. Okay. And using the metaphor of this world being the dream place. Right, right. Somebody who has entered into um, abiding non-dual awareness, that's my, my phrase of the week, abiding non-dual awareness. I like the sound of it, it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> uh, rolls trippingly off your that tongue. Is, yeah, that is awakening from the dream right. rather than awakening in the dream. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah. So uh, a human adult lives within Maya. Mm -hmm. They just don't operate in the way a child operates. They have different qualities. They are, they are no longer pups. They are actual responsible members of the species. Okay. And most people never grow This, this is something that I get kind of axiomatic about because uh, it's the only thing so far, you know, it's kind of Occam's razor-ish. It's the only thing so far that explains humanity simply, which is that we get stuck at somewhere around puberty. And what you get is not somebody who is um, 65. You get somebody who is, you know, 15 with you know 50 years of experience at being 15. Okay, so let's let's focus on that a bit then. So uh, okay. what's the essential aspect? What's the essential? Well, what what essentially is going on in the fact that a person has not yet grown up? Is it that he has not yet created this unified persona? Or is it that he's not no, yet? Woke no, up? you you can have you can have a fragmented persona, and be an adult. Okay, it means the parts will work better. The yeah, the only reason I think that you need to to create the unified persona is if you're going for the whole enlightenment shooting match. And okay, most well, that, people, that in my experience, don't actually want that. Right, but that's but that's maybe be my not next until question. about a week before they die. <laughs> Yes. But that's my next question that would be, is having a unified persona an essential step in order to wake up? Or is it? I think 
not? I think that it is an essential step to waking up effectively. You see people who wake up. Um, Rajneesh was a great example of that. As far as I can tell, he had a true and valid awakening in the beginning. Right. But it was the kind of spontaneous awakening that did not, uh, that he didn't do any more work on. Um, and because of that, he left holes that the, 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 the dark side of the force could enter into. And we get antelope, uh, Oregon and the, right. the Rajneesh Param ranch and poisoning people in, in the restaurant. Right. Yeah. That's, that is the, um, consequence of his not taking care of his persona. Right. It, towards the end of his stay here, he was constantly sick. He was, it, there was nothing that he could tolerate. And that came from not unifying his persona because all of these parts were fighting for their attention as far as I can tell. Okay. I like that. that, that I've makes... seen, yeah. yeah. I've seen this happen over and over again. And it happened to me. You know, I had my first awakening at 13. And I was nowhere prepared for it. That should never happen at that age. That's like way too young. Mm -hmm. And it left me adrift for several years trying to figure out what to do. You know, I kept trying to get back to that state, mm -hmm. which was, it's like the stupidest thing that you can do. It's like, oh, I need to bite my teeth again. To, to yeah. steal a little phrase from Alan Watts. You know, it's, but I was too young to be able to process that. I, my, my persona had not matured enough and it created some, some pretty drastic problems for me. Most of which were addressed by moving to Haight-Ashbury in 1967 and taking lots of LSD. Yes. I'm being slightly facetious with that. Well, but, you know, uh, that I mean, that's, it's, it's, say. it's a, it's a drug we need to pay, I think, respect for and honor because it hasn't yeah. done a lot of things for a lot of people, you know, uh, including myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It definitely helped. Uh, yeah. it wasn't the, the, the final thing, but it definitely kicked me out of my, uh, my idea that, oh, that, that state that I experienced that one time, uh, was something special because, it's easy to get back there. You take this, wait a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And so that, that got me looking for different things. Uh, so that was very useful. But yeah, my first awakening experience, my ego was completely fragmented. I was a teenager for God's sake, you know, a bundle of hormones. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. Not the time you want to experience a, a moment of enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. All right, so what you're saying, if I understand it, is that in order to effectively pres be present in the world and be grounded in, well, yeah, and I guess, yeah, it's an and, and be grounded in this non-dual awareness, you need to have this need to develop or at least work on having this unified persona. Right? Yeah. Because that's the one if that... If you don't, the fragments will come back and bite you in the right. ass. Right, right. Yeah. And but we're not saying that in order to wake up, you necessarily need to have a unified persona because we've seen examples of yeah. people who've woken up and who've had still fragmented yeah. personas and gotten into trouble, right? Yeah. I okay. think to stay awake effectively you need the, to, to, to have the unified persona. And that persona has to be awake. You have to be disidentified with it. Uh, and you have to uh, really clean up its functioning. And of course, I could be totally wrong about all of this, you know? Of course. Uh, of course. I'm pretty sure I'm not, but I could be. Yeah. Yeah. No, and all, all we can do is, you know, take whatever our best... Uh, understanding of this stuff is and then push it and see where it goes, you know? And, um, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that, you know? 
Uh, in fact, I'm much happier with that than some dogmatic presentation of, you know, this is the way it is, and if you follow my path, you will, you know, reach the top of the mountain. <laughs> yeah, which may or may not be true, but it's not yeah. something that I particularly feel comfortable with. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is never actually true. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's never actually true. The, there, there are either infinite paths up the mountain or no paths at all. And you just climb one or the other. Some people, I mean, you can go, uh, follow me. I'll show you how to get up the mountain and it, they'll fall, they'll fall off the cliff because they didn't put their hand where you put your hand. But there are but dogmatists. If, yeah. Dogmatists are, are something to stay away from. All right. But there are effective <laughs> paths up the mountain, right? I mean, there I, are there are, posts, there, there are there are effective paths for for going up the mountain for certain people. Right, a path and, and a person. You get a really good path, and it doesn't fit the person, and they're still going to fall off. Right. This is one of the things that that Sufis take as an axiom, which is each person's path must be created. Uh, specifically for them, for who they are in the time that they exist, in the place that they exist. Uh, and what some dude a thousand years ago did can be indicative, but it can't be your path. Okay, so now you, you can't do what Ibn al-Arabi did, but you can do what Ibn al-Arabi did. Mm -hmm. But now let's take... If you are doing your role as a teacher, let's say, okay, you're pres presuming that you have a better clue as to what, say, my particular path or somebody else's particular path would be, right? No, so, I'm not presuming that. I am presuming that I know how to listen as you tell me. Mm. There's a big difference. So you're basically being a midwife to my own discovery of my yeah. optimal path up the mountain. Basically. Yeah, I, I, I spent 50 years, just about 50 years, being trained to see uh, ahead of people uh, as they proceed upon their way, mm -hmm. learning all of the techniques of guiding. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the techniques that you have to learn is you don't know where the person needs to go. They know where they need to go. They don't know where they need to go, but they know. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you if you listen correctly, and then you can show them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no path for you or anybody else. Right. All I have is the ability to listen very, very carefully to what every part of you says and weigh that and, and make the best choices I can. For what I present to you. So you're basically clarifying and reflecting back what that person at some level knows to be their path? Is that accurate? Uh, not that, they, not that it, they know that it's their path, but they know where they need to go. Mm. And one of the reasons that I'm excited to, to, to let other people see uh, our conversations is because they're going to look and go, how come he never talks to me like that? Mm -hmm. He tells me these totally different things. You know, we focus on this. We focus on that. We don't, you never talk to me about this. This is an example of you work with what the person wants, what they need, where they're going not where you think they should. This is not a one-size-fits-all path. Right. And I, mean, that, I don't even give everybody exactly the same breathing practice, and that's as close to one-size-fits-all as I get. Yeah. And that presumes that the person you're working with is not so dispersed that they actually have a reasonable chance of proceeding in the right or at least a workable direction. Because I mean, I've yeah. met people that are so dispersed that, uh, I, you know, if, if I listen to them, <laughs> all I see is chaos, really, you know, in a sense. Yeah, and they aren't actually doing the work. Exactly, exactly. You know, and, and I don't see much... By the time somebody gets to me, they have, they have clarified that. If they 
actually have come to work, I don't need to worry about that part because they've, they've already found their focus. Right. Yeah, and I look at, at my, my, my protégés and each of them is totally and utterly different. Mm -hmm. um, and each of them has a very different focus. Um, you've seen three of the four, you know, Kyle, Mark, and Nick. Mm -hmm. And each of them is, is utterly different. We talk about different things. Um, we address the, we address the issues that are salient to them, not the issues that are the one size fits all path from me. Right. Yeah. Okay. But, but obviously in your role, one of your jobs in some sense is to, uh, indicate, uh, useless dead ends, right? <laughs> that they might be oh, on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I do that when they run up against them, uh, right. which doesn't happen that often, which is kind of nice. In some ways, I'm very blessed because other people have done the hard work for me oftentimes. Uh -huh. <laughs> or they themselves have pounded their heads against a particular wall long enough yes. to have link to turn their other direction. Okay. Yeah. Makes yep. Sense. Yeah. Actually, that one of the things that I found curious I mean, there there in in the yogic tradition there's the whole bhakti path right we you know uh, and there's at least one guy i know that claims that you're getting me on a hot spot here uh oh <laughs> yeah go ahead claims that that one of the best ways uh one of the best paths is to sort of be so in love with something preferably uh, some actual person of, of the opposite sex or, or same sex, uh, that, that that so focuses one's intention and desire, that that focus in itself facilitates an opening. Now, obviously, the bhakti path, you know, uh, has seems to have worked for people. I mean, I, 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 I don't resonate with that myself, but I'm wondering whether, you know, I'm missing out on something important here, you know. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. This is, this is where, uh, this is where I get in trouble because I, I tend to be kind of more plain spoken about this than, uh, I probably should be. According we can censor to censor this part of the recording if you want. <laughs> no, we won't because I don't care. Okay. And the bhakti path was invented so that gurus could get their shopping done for them, their houses cleaned for them, and their gardens weeded for them. Um, the whole idea of the, the selfless devotion to another person is crap. And it takes away half the person. Yes, emotion is important, feelings are important, love is important, but it is not more important than intellect. It is not more important than reason. They are all equally important. And none of them are more important than the person's own agency. So, bhakti yoga where you devote yourself to the guru, I, I have always found it to be bullshit. And, and people are surprised because we have been trained to that in this culture. And when one of my two students comes to me and says, um, what can I do to help you, oh, wise mystical one? And I say, well, you could do this for me. And they say, I would love to. And then I say, and I will pay you this much for doing it. And they're shocked. Mm -hmm. But I have this rule that nobody does things for me without equal recompense in some way. Mm -hmm. Because the idea that they should work for free for me is crap. Uh, and yet there are some people who totally love it. And that's fine. It will get you to high states of consciousness. It won't wake you up, but it will get you to high states of consciousness. How can you wake, how can you wake up if you are totally identified with some other person? Right. Well, I think at, at least in the, uh, in the little I've read of it, I mean, you get to that point because at some point what you're identifying with becomes yourself in a sense because it becomes you know consciousness as such or this this non-dual ground you know becomes god you know so. yeah it, it sounds that sounds pretty groovy uh i don't buy it 
Right. You know, I, 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 I mean, I'm cynic when it comes to that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I tend to agree with that, but I wonder, I, I always sometimes wonder whether that's uh, not a blind spot for me, you know, because I can see where that would actually f focus. I mean, if we're talking about integrating into a single persona, I mean, surely that's a very focusing uh, practice, right? But uh, the last step of the practice is to disidentify with the persona. Right, right. That's that's the thing, and and it may be it's it's definitely a little bit of a hot spot for me because uh, I uh, yeah I remember back when I was I was a, a young guy coming up and there was this one teacher who he had everybody doing selfless service for him and it's like this is good for you and then I I look and I'm watching him make bank off of what people are doing. He's getting all of this free work. And it's not like he couldn't pay for it. It's because he wanted to get rich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found, I found myself uh, morally offended by that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, he wasn't doing any selfless service to anybody. He was charging through the nose for what he did. Right, right. Right. Though, though I, I've, I've certainly have heard of or not necessarily had any direct relation to people who themselves uh, well I mean Ram Dass I guess is an example of that you know someone who is actually yeah. selflessly I think you know de helping people with their last days and stuff like that you know uh, and I he seems to be on a essentially a bhakti path you know yeah um, I haven't seen Ram Dass in decades, so I'm, I'm not sure what he's up to these days. Mm. <coughs> uh, whatever it is, I probably like it because I like Ram Dass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what he's doing is not enlightenment. That part is not being awake. But neither is our conversation now, right? No, I mean, of course they're not. This is all, not. Well, all either, these are, I mean, whether it's the rational mind or the emotive self or the sensuous self, any of those practices are not themselves waking up. Yeah. Right? They're at best. Let us, let us, though, suggest that this conversation is, in fact, not waking up, but coming from an awake place. Yes. And that's different. We speak in metaphors and similes, and we, we point at, moon, at the moon with our finger because that's the only way we can talk about what we're doing. But we're both talking about it from that place that we can enter into that is us as uh, that which is awake. Right. Right. Yes. 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 And so the Ignore real... the man behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> or my wife behind the door. <laughs> <laughs> so that part of the discussion becomes most important really when you're trying to work with somebody else, maybe, or even with yourself, uh, in order to facilitate a movement towards an integrated self and right. an eventual waking. Yeah, earlier today, one of the people I work with asked me a question to, to this effect, which was, you know, what do you do when you work with a group of people? How do you work with them from an awake state? You know, how do you know what they need? And, right. um, you know, we, 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 were, we were talking about that. And, you know, I use a couple of different tools. You know, I use uh, the, the, the chief feature. I look for the chief feature of each person and, and I've learned ways to recognize those. And here's an interesting thing. The group itself, if you're working with a group, will form its own chief feature. And you have to learn to perceive that and, and work in concert with that rather than in opposition with it most of the time um, in order to be effectively teaching. And then you have to be enter, you have to be able to enter into flow state for teaching. Uh, you literally have to teach from Samadhi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
which is not a state of mind, it is a practice. Right. It's interesting, but you know, one of the people that I've learned quite a bit from was Junpo Kelly. I mean, and he's got these mm-hmm. this, this koan practice, and, and he keeps insisting, well, what you're still doing, you're always transmitting. You're transmitting a state, whatever the particulars yes. of it are. You're trans, and if you're not transmitting a state, then forget the rest of the shit. You know, because it's not. Really yeah, if you're not transmitting a state, you're you're either dead or a robot. One of the two. Yeah. Could be a rock. Could be a robot. But in this case, you want to be transmitting a fairly specific state, uh, basically a non-dual yeah. state, right? You know. Yeah, so. yeah, and it and it's not just for the transmitting of it. It is for the being able to process what you are given clearly. Right. right. You know, if if I am lost in my own content and you say something to me, that gets filtered through my content. In order to speak to you like this, I have to turn that damn content off. It has to be. Uh, put in abeyance so I can just be clearly here with you, listening to you, not making judgments, not making assumptions, uh, and responding uh, from the clearest state I can. And that seems, I mean, I've, I, I sometimes wonder what you get out of the martial arts, and that seems to be one of the things you would probably get out of the martial arts. I mean, if you're not simply clearly there and able to respond yeah. to the immediate stimulus i mean you're probably gonna get whacked you know? yeah yeah oh yeah i mean i this is why i fence because uh, there is truth at the point of a sword mm-hmm. you are either awake to what your opponent does or you're not and if you're not you're going to get stabbed a lot right <laughs> right makes sense makes perfect sense yeah 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 i, I I've, I've noticed the things that you sometimes about that sort of group uh, persona almost happening, you know. And I'm actually looking really forward to your your uh, your uh, you know your course on uh, the yeah the enneagram you yeah because I mean that's something yeah. that I I definitely need more work on is how you know how to recognize yeah stuff, I guess. and I I've basically designed this course to be uh. Uh, one for teachers. Uh, this is this is not for people to to amuse themselves by. This is for people who need it in their work in one way or another. Because if you understand this, and if if you can use it as the template for how the mechanical nature of each person works, then you have a leg up. And you can usually craft a pretty good situation, whether it's a one-on-one counseling situation or 200 people in a room that you're lecturing to. Yeah, because one, one of my curiosities at the moment is how to effectively work with a group. I mean, you know, I've got this, this yeah. back project group, you know, and I'm wondering, you know, what? I mean, the, the, and they're kind of wallowing in, you know, oh, way is me, I've got this issue and I've got this issue. And, and I... And I keep wanting to look for a way to sort of uh, undercut all that and, and say, okay, yeah. the real issue is, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'm not sure. The real issue is that you think you have issues and you're looking at them and you're not looking at the exactly. world around you. Exactly. You're being the problem rather than the solution. Are they being the problem? Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and then, of course, I find myself doing that also. I mean, I find myself still doing a lot of that shit, you know, just, uh, yeah. And then backing out of it and saying, what the fuck am I doing? You know, <laughs> you know, it's, just, <laughs> it's such a weird game at times, you know, just, it really is. Yeah. Okay. So one of, one of the things that I had planned on asking you about was, but, but it's may already have been answered, was whether this whole process is a gradient process or whether it's a sudden awakening and seeing of something. And it seems to me that if I understand your, your position, your company is both. I mean, the, the creation of the unified self is the gradient process, but the actual waking is, you know, waking yeah. or not. Waking, yeah, waking is interesting because you are either awake or you're asleep. There, that's where I am black and white is in that. There is no such things as levels of enlightenment. 
levels of enlightenment it's absolute bullshit if you're awake you're as awake as awake as siddhartha was you were as awake as patanjali was you were awake as yeshua ben Maryam was you are as awake as any awake person has ever been no more no less and every moment that you are awake is exactly the same state as that there is no gradient to that identified not identified it, to, to say otherwise is like it, it's that old saw of being a little bit pregnant right right, right. right. yeah it's it, this this is this is a pretty cut and dry state other than that how you maintain that is where the gradient comes in i can i can wake anyone up i can bring anyone to a state of full enlightenment for about two to three seconds maybe but getting them to stay there is the trick that's where the abiding comes in yeah yeah and and then i guess the question arises i mean it's kind of a weird question but but what's so important about abiding i mean this whole friggin game the answer is, is nothing exactly nothing. Yeah. i mean it's part yeah, of this there, whole there's nothing game. important about it. yeah yeah, yeah. And if you want to play the game, if you want to be in the game of life on planet Earth, you cannot allow yourself to slip fully into abiding non-dual awareness. Hence the need for the persona. Mm -hmm. It anchors you here. Right. And so, you know, think, think, about, think about Krishna. Uh, in, you know, in the story of Krishna, you know, he goes off, he helps Arjuna get all enlightened and you know delivers his message and then he's done and he goes wandering off into the forest and lays down and a hunter mistakes him for a deer and shoots him with an arrow and kills him because once he was done with his work he just let go so let's take a look at what's I mean, so to be present in this world and playing this game, I mean, ideally, you've got kind of a foot in both camps. I mean, on the one hand, you're aware of your groundedness in what you would call non-dual awareness. And on the other hand, you're fully engaged with the present phenomena that are arising and that you're responding to, hopefully, without too many uh, intervening reactive type stuff. Right? So you're basically, uh, you're basically being an amphibian, some people describe it. You know, you're on, on the one hand, uh, you're grounded in this non-dual awareness. On the other hand, you're fully present in the phenomenal world, right? And yeah, this, this gets, right. we're going to uh, discuss, discuss this at length week after next on Sunday. Ah. This is the fourth precept, uh, which is um, in Arabic or in, in Persian, Khawat Dar Anjuman, which is, translates as solitude. Khawat means retreat or solitude, uh, to be in a state of, uh, you know, going off into a cave in the mountains and, and sitting and meditating. So retreat within the crowd, within the world to be inwardly awake and outwardly fully participating in life right right as as one of the zen dudes says you know uh to do this in a marketplace is a hell of a lot better than to do it solitary in a cave someplace because you're you know yes yes yeah that, that that's that's the sufi point of view yeah. that anybody can be enlightened on the top of a mountain right do it in the market right 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 yeah well i will look forward to that talk i guess but, you know, um, yeah yeah so uh let's see if something just was tickling at my consciousness there and yeah it's gone now it's gone okay okay here here is a slightly different topic um when we talk about reactive pattern Okay. Uh, in some stuff that I've been exposed to, 
there are deep structures to reactive patterns. And there's something to be said for, and these deep structures are not usually obvious. You know, they're, uh, they're, uh, and the, there's something to be said for surfacing and exploring and essentially dissolving these deep structures. Uh, do you have anything like that in your tradition? Um, yeah, well, we understand that there are deep structures. Uh, we also understand that that whole concept has been seriously misused, uh, mostly so that people will be able to uh, keep the client coming back. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, the, the great example is the Freudians who, you know, you're in, uh, yeah, you're in analysis for five, six, seven years, once, twice a week going and, and exploring all of the deep structures of why you do what you do. And at the end of it, you still do what you do. Yeah. You're just more comfortable with it. Uh, but, yeah, well, give me, give me an example of the kind of deep structures that you deal with in your tradition. So, the chief feature of a person is built on deep structure. It is built on stuff that, that goes down usually to early childhood, mm -hmm. uh, to a fundamental wound that is given to the person. Mm -hmm. um, using Sufi metaphors, this could be construed as the mark of Cain. Mm -hmm. You remember Cain yes. you know, messes up and God curses him? Yes. So the fundamental wound is like that. Everybody gets one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe Jesus didn't get one. I don't know. I wasn't mm -hmm. there. Uh, but we don't know what he did for the first 33 years of his life either. So um, all we saw was the effect of that first 33 years of practice. Mm -hmm. But it, go ahead. the deep structure is, is something that needs to be addressed. It just doesn't need to take hundreds of thousands of dollars and multiple years to do it. It's interesting in, in the Mankind Project tradition, one of the things that they do is sort of try to want to cover the deep wounding. And on, in their view, it's this deep wounding that then leads to one's uh, mission in life in a sense, because you know, they're trying to sort of deal with yeah. that wound ever, ever after almost, you know. Well, the, the deep wounding is what creates the fixation of attention. Mm -hmm. It's what stops you from progressing because your attention is, is forever after fixated on that world. Mm -hmm. There are relatively easy ways of dealing with that world, but you have to get to the person, the person to the state where they want to. Mm -hmm. The thing that we, we make this, uh, this mistake of thinking that people want to heal. Yeah. People don't want to heal. They want everybody to appreciate their illness. Yes, yes. yes. It's great to be a victim, isn't it, sometimes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And one of the things that does, it sucks other people into your orbit and sucks their energy and all that shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I assume that two weeks from now, whenever you're going to be discussing this, you're going to talk about some of the ways that you effectively deal with these deep wounds, right? Probably. I mean, the, the entire, this, this series of the talks that I'm doing are the, the fundamental path for dealing with the deep wounds. The, the, the nine precepts are uh, the, the markers for how one antidotes the uh, the process of being wounded, mm. uh, and so that that's the value of that is that we have this uh, this really nice meta model for how to work. And the meta model, I call it a meta model because you create an individual model for each person from the meta model. Mm. 
it was more like a template That's, almost. Yeah. 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 And it's like, here's how this concept will work for you as opposed to that guy over there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, solitude in the crowd will look this way for you. This is how you will practice it as opposed to how the other person practices it. Mm -hmm. And you got to be clear on that. For me, I would love to be practicing solitude of the, in the crowd by, yeah, my, my uh, ideal is, is the sweeper. That's why I have the sweeper as, as my, uh, my avatar on Facebook. The sweeper is this guy who is just in the garden. He's cleaning up. He's nobody. Uh, nobody pays any attention to him. And he just does his, his thing behind the scenes. Um, and I like that. I, I would be happy to be the sweeper. Unfortunately, the universe tells me that that's not my damn job. Yeah. And every time I be the sweeper, it comes back and it gets me. And you wouldn't miss your at re interactions with your students? I mean, they, uh, it seems to me that's, you know, from what I can see, that seems like a very essential part of your makeup, you know. I mean, I'm you're a transmitter of knowledge. Yeah. As well. But I, I also am very, very clear that my job is to create teachers out of my students and let them loose into the world without them having to have me standing around looking over their shoulders. Right. Once they learn, they have to fly out of the nest on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, that I'm going to be there telling them what to do forever, is it, it, that ain't going to work. That's but you're not, not going to return to sweeping the garden, are you? You're still going to find some new batch of students that you're going to try to convert into. There might be somebody who needs to learn how to sweep effectively. There might be. There might be. Yeah. There might be. There might be. But like I said, the universe is very clear that being the sweeper, at least at this part of uh, time of my life, is, is not my job. And it won't yeah. let me do it. Yeah. yeah. And if I try and do it, it creates problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And have you tried to do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> On multiple occasions. Yeah. I've tried to be the sweeper and uh, it, it doesn't quite work. The universe keeps saying, no. Yeah. Not that. This. But I don't want to do that. I want to sweep the garden. No. Get your ass over there and do this. Uh -huh. A little wind but comes into the garden. Okay, let me, let me, yeah. Also. Yeah, exactly. It's like, all right, let's burn down the garden then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you got to pay attention because the universe is bigger than you. As opposed to being within you? Uh, yeah, as opposed to being within you. The, the full phrase is the universe is within you and without you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a tough one also, you know, because it's, I mean, what gets me sometimes is these <sighs> probably necessary shifts of perspective, but that still feel like shifts of perspective, you know, like uh, that where, where the shift is almost sometimes an attempt to solve a problem. I mean, like, yeah. I was, I was when I was in... Every perspective is false in yeah. some sense. Right, right, right. But every perspective often gives you a new viewpoint also, you know. Yes, of course. Yeah, so... Yeah, you can see this side of the house, but you can't see that side right, of the house. Right, right, right. Because I find myself... Well, I, probably the, the two most vocal voices at the moment are the ones that say, well, you got to get your butt in gear and do something worthwhile. And on the other hand, well, shit, it's all nice. I can just relax and just enjoy it. And maybe yeah. in your metaphor, sweep the garden or whatever the hell, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and both of those are appealing. Both of those are strong. Yeah. Where is the voice that says, I am doing something worthwhile? Right. And that's the one I need to cultivate. I mean, we talked about that last yes. time, in a sense, you know. And, yeah. And that's the one that's still a child's voice, almost, you know. It's not mm -hmm. yet a fully developed voice. There's something childish about that still, 
a certain childish insecurity still there about that. And that's one I need to definitely explore more, you know, because it's just. Yep. That sounds like the one that you, you, uh, where your work is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I yeah. Think and so. the more you mature that, the better everybody is going to be, you know, yeah. Yeah. all of the people who you work with are going to be way better off if you're speaking from that place. Yeah. Yeah. And it's probably the path always that will begin to unify these different voices, you know, Yes, because it's the it's in a sense it's that that third force you know uh, that you talk mm -hmm. about so eloquently yeah. sometimes you know yeah yep what right. Mr G talks about as the magnetic center magnetic center the, exactly. the little crystal that begins to draw the other fragments to it yeah and the damn thing is it's little at least when it starts out it's damn little you know it's not this yes, big bang is. meteor coming down which organizes <laughs> everything you know? yeah yeah yeah. Well, I am seeing the time and I have my next conversation is coming up in just a couple of minutes. All right. So, well, we I enjoyed it. Wrap it? this one up. Okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And it, this will be another one, if you don't mind, that I might like to share around because I think we've, we have covered some really interesting topics. Like I said, I think that we're, we're doing something here that is more interesting than just you and I talking. I, I think I agree. You know, I have both a sort of an objective and a subjective interest in seeing this yeah. available. One of the, the objective one is that I think it does provide objective examples of something that's worthwhile. The subjective one is yeah. a bunch of hubris. I mean, it's kind of, it's a way of you know, be, becoming more known yeah. to the group in a sense, which is also nice, you know, so yeah. both and, of them. And that's are. nice. But to me, what's important is that you ask very mature questions. You know, you and and those are the kind of questions that everybody benefits from. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that we can create this dialogue together like this is, I think, uh, it has value beyond just our conversation. I, I I agree. I agree. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's see where it goes. You know. Okay, myself, I appreciate the your time, and um, you know, now let's see if it continues. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we will hopefully talk again soon. Sounds good.